Monsieur de Beauvais had, as he said, passed the funeral procession that was taking Valentine to her final resting place. A true Parisian, Monsieur de Villefort regarded the Père de Lachaise's cemetery as the only one worthy of receiving the mortal remains of a Parisian family. Only there could a well-bred corpse feel at home. He had therefore bought a vault there and had the words St. Moran and Villefort inscribed on it. Such had been the dying wish of poor René, Valentine's mother. The procession was composed predominantly of young people who had been struck by Valentine's death as though by a thunderbolt, and who, despite the cold and prosaic tenor of the times, were deeply affected by the thought of the death of such a beautiful, chaste, and adorable girl, cut off in the flower of her youth. As the procession was approaching the outskirts of Paris, it was overtaken by a carriage drawn by four swift horses. The Count of Monte Cristo climbed out of the carriage and mingled with a crowd following the hearse on foot. Chateau Renaud and Beauchamp soon noticed him and came beside him. "'Have you seen Maximilian Morel?' asked the Count." No, replied Chateau Renaud. We were wondering about him when the procession began because none of us saw him. The Count said nothing, but he continued to look around him. However, he did not find what he was looking for until he, the procession reached the cemetery. There he saw Maximilian standing beside a tree on, on top of a hillock overlooking the vault. The Count watched him all through the ceremony. Look, there's Maximilian Morel, said Beauchamp to Debray suddenly. What's he doing up there? See how pale he is? said Chateau Renaud. He's cold, said Debray. No, I think he's agitated, replied Chateau Renaud so slowly. He's a very emotional man. Why, he hardly knew Mademoiselle de Villefort. That's true, but I remember his seeing him dance three times with her at, the, at a ball once. The ceremony is over, said Monte Cristo abruptly. Goodbye, gentlemen. And he walked off as the rest of the crowd began to prepare for the trip back to town. Monte Cristo hid himself behind a tombstone and watched Maximilian's movements. The, the young man slowly approached the vault, which was now abandoned, and knelt before it, and he pressed his forehead against the stone and murmured, Oh, Valentine! The Count's heart was deeply affected by the way these words were uttered. He stepped forward, touched Maximilian on the shoulder, and said, I was looking for you, my friend. He expected an outburst of reproach or recrimination, but he was mistaken. Maximilian turned around and said, with apparent calm. I was praying. The Count looked at him searchingly for a time after which he seemed to feel more reassured. Would you like me to take you back to town? He asked. No, thank you. Is there anything I can do for you? Let me pray. The Count walked off without saying anything further, but he took up another post of observation from which he watched Maximilian's every move. The young man finally stood up and began to walk back to town. Monte Cristo dismissed his carriage, which had been waiting for him, and walked after him, following him from a hundred paces behind. Five minutes after the door of the house in the Rue Maslay closed behind Maximilian, it opened for Monte Cristo. Julie was in the garden, attentively watching Penelon, who took his profession of gardener very seriously at work on some rose bushes. Oh, the Count of Monte Cristo! she exclaimed with the joy which each member of the family always manifested when the Count paid a visit. Maximilian just came home, didn't he? asked Monte Cristo. Yes, I think I saw him go past, replied the young woman. Excuse me, but I must see him immediately. I have something extremely important to tell him. Go right on up then, said Julie. She watched him with her charming smile until he had disappeared up the staircase. When Monte Cristo arrived in front of Maximilian's room on the third floor, he stopped and listened. There was no sound. The door had a glass panel, but it was impossible to see through it because it was covered by a red curtain hung on the inside. The Count reflected for a moment. Shall I ring, he thought. No, the sound of the doorbell often hastens the resolution of one in Maximilian's situation, and another sound answers the sound of the bell. He shuddered from head to foot. Then making a decision with his usual swiftness, he broke the glass panel with his elbow, pushed aside the curtain, and saw Maximilian at his desk with a pen in his hand. He started up from his chair at the sound of the breaking glass. Excuse me, said the Count. I slipped and my elbow went through the glass. But since it's broken, I'll take advantage of it to open the door. Don't bother to get up. He put his arm through the hole, unlocked the door, and opened it. Maximilian, clearly annoyed, stepped forward, less in order to receive the Count than to block his way. It's your servant's fault, said the Count, rubbing his elbow. Your floors are as shiny as mirrors. Did you hurt yourself? asked Maximilian coldly. I don't know. Were you writing just now? Yes, even a soldier writes now and then. Monte Cristo stepped further into the room. Maximilian had to let him pass, but he followed him. The Count cast a glance around the room. 
What are your pistols doing there? He asked, pointing to the weapons lying on the desk. I'm about to go on a journey, replied Maximilian. Maximilian, said Monte Cristo. Let's take off the masks we're both wearing. You don't deceive me with your artificial calmness any more than I deceive you with my frivolous solicitude. I'm sure you realize that in order to have broken into a friend's room, I must have been moved by genuine apprehension or rather a terrible conviction. Maximilian, you want to kill yourself. Maximilian started and said, where did you get such an idea, Count? I repeat that you want to kill yourself, replied the Count, and here's the proof. He walked over to the desk, raised the sheet of paper the young man had placed over the letter he had begun, and picked up the letter. Maximilian rushed forward to snatch it out of his hand, but the Count seized him by the wrist in a grip of steel. What if I'm going to kill myself, cried Maximilian, abandoning his pretense of calm. Who will have the courage to prevent me? When I say all my hopes are ruined, my heart is broken, my life is ended, and there is nothing around me but mourning and dismay, who will answer? You're wrong. Would you have the courage to say that, Count? Yes, I would, replied the Count in a tone whose calmness contrasted strangely with the young man's violence. You, cried Maximilian in growing anger and reproach, you lured me on with absurd hopes. You lulled me with vain promises when, by some desperate action, I could have either saved her or at least seen her die in my arms. You pretend to play the part of Providence, and you don't even have the power to give an antidote to a girl who has been poisoned. Maximilian, you told me to take off my mask, and that's just what I'm doing. When you followed me to the cemetery, I spoke to you courteously because I have a good heart. But since you've come here to interfere with me in the room that is about to become my tomb, since you've brought me a new torture when I thought I'd exhausted them all, you're about to watch your friend die. Maximilian reached for his pistols again with an insane laugh, but Monte Cristo, his eyes flashing fire, stopped him once more and said, Maximilian, you will not kill yourself. Try to stop me then, cried Maximilian, still struggling to reach his pistols, but still powerless in the Count's merciless grip. I will stop you. Who are you to behave so tyrannically toward a man who's free to make his own decisions? Who am I? Listen, and I'll tell you. I am the only man in the world who has a right to say to you, Maximilian, I won't allow your father's son to die today. Why do you speak of my father? stammered Maximilian. Why do you mingle his memory with what's happening to me today? Because I'm the man who saved your father's life one day because he wanted to kill himself just as you want to kill yourself today. Because I'm the man who sent the purse to your sister and the Ferran to your father because I'm Edmond Dantes, who used to play with you on my knees when you were a child. Maximilian staggered back, overwhelmed. His strength abandoned him and he fell to the floor. Then suddenly, completely regenerated, he leaped to his feet and rushed to the hall, shouting, Julie! Julie! Emmanuel! Emmanuel! Monte Cristo tried to come after him, but Maximilian closed the door and would have died before he let the Count open it. Julie and Emmanuel ran upstairs to, in answer to Maximilian's cries. He took them by the hand, opened the door, and said in a voice choked with emotion, On your knees! This is our benefactor, the man who saved our father's life. This is, he was going to say, this is Edmond Dantes, but the Count stopped him by gripping his arm. Julie clutched the Count's hand. Emmanuel embraced him as though, as though he were a tutelary god, and Maximilian once again fell to his knees. At that moment, the man of bronze felt his heart swell in his chest, and a flame seemed to dart from his throat to his eyes. He bowed his head and wept. When she had recovered a little from her first emotion, Julie ran out of the room, down the stairs, and into the salon where, with childish joy, she lifted the crystal globe protecting the purse that had been given to her by the stranger of the Ali de Mion. Meanwhile, Emmanuel was saying to the Count, Oh, Count, you heard us speak of our unknown benefactor. You saw with what gratitude and adoration we surrounded his memory. Why did you wait for so long to reveal yourself? My friend, replied the Count, the discovery of this secret was brought on by a great event which must remain unknown to you. God is my witness that I wanted to keep it buried in my own soul for the rest of my life. But Maximilian has torn it from me by a violence which I'm sure he regrets now. Seeing that Maximilian had sunk into a chair on the other side of the room, Monte Cristo added in a low voice, Watch over him. Why? asked Emmanuel in surprise. I can't tell you why, but watch over him. Emmanuel looked around the room and perceived Maximilian's pistols. He stared at them in alarm and slowly pointed to them. The Count nodded. 
Manuel made a movement toward the pistols, but the count said, leave them alone. And he went over to Maximilian and took his hand. The tumultuous emotions which had shaken the young man's heart had now given way to a dazed torpor. Julie entered the room, holding the silken purse in her hand as two glistening tears of joy rolled down her cheeks. Here's the relic, she said. Don't think it's any less dear to me now that the Savior has revealed himself. Let me take back that purse, said Monte Cristo, blushing. Since, since you now know my face, I want to be remembered only by the affection which I beg you to grant me. Oh no, exclaimed Julie, pressing the purse to her heart. Please don't take it back. I'm afraid you'll leave us some day. You've guessed correctly, replied Monte Cristo, smiling. Within a week, I'll have left this country where so many people who deserve the vengeance of heaven were living in happiness while my father died of hunger and grief. As he said this, Monte Cristo kept his eyes fixed on Maximilian, and he noticed that the words, I'll have left this country, passed without drawing the young man from his lethargy. Taking Julian Emmanuel by the hand, he said to them with the gentle authority of a father, please leave me alone with Maximilian now. Julie saw her chance to take away the precious relic which the Count had forgotten to mention again. She hurriedly pulled her husband out of the room, leaving Monte Cristo alone with Maximilian, who continued to remain as motionless as a statue. Maximilian, said Monte Cristo, touching him with his finger, are you ready to become a man again? Yes, I'm beginning to suffer again. The Count frowned. Maximilian, he said, you're giving in to the ideas that are unworthy of a Christian. Oh, don't worry, my friend, said Maximilian, raising his face and showing the Count a smile permeated with unspeakable sadness. I won't seek out death now. No, I'll have better than a pistol to cure me of my grief. My grief itself will kill me. My friend, said Monte Cristo, in a tone of melancholy equal to Maximilian's, listen to me. One day, in a moment of despair, I too wanted to kill myself. One day your father, equally desperate, also wanted to kill himself. If, at that supreme moment when your father was pointing the pistol at his forehead, or when I was pushing away the food I hadn't touched for three days, someone had said to both of us, live, for a day will come when you will be happy and bless life. We would both have listened to those words with a smile of doubt or with the anguish of incredulity. And yet, how often did your father later bless life? How often have I myself... You only lost your liberty, interrupted Maximilian, and my father only lost his fortune, but I've lost Valentine. Look at me, Maximilian, said Monte Cristo, with a solemnity which on certain occasions made him so commanding and persuasive. There are no tears in my eyes, my heart is not throbbing painfully, and there is no fever in my veins, and yet I'm now watching you suffer, you whom I love as though you were my son. Doesn't that tell you that suffering is like life? that there is always something unknown beyond it? If I beg you, if I order you to live, Maximilian, it's because I'm convinced that someday you'll thank me for having preserved your life for you. Oh my God, Count, cried the young man. What are you saying? Haven't you ever been in love? Child, replied the Count. I'm speaking of real love, continued Maximilian. I've been a soldier ever since I became a man. I've lived to the age of 29 without ever being in love for nothing I felt till then deserves the name of love. Then I found Valentine and, I, and I've been in love with her for two years. With Valentine Count, my happiness was infinite, unheard of, a happiness too great, too complete, too divine for this world. And now that she's gone, there is nothing left for me but heartbreak and despair. I have told you to hope, Maximilian. Be careful, Count. You're trying to persuade me, and if you do, you'll make me lose my reason, or you'll make me believe I'll see Valentine again. The Count smiled. Let me tell you again to be careful, said Maximilian excitedly. The ascendancy you have over me frightens me. Be careful of what you say, or you'll make me believe in supernatural things. Hope, my friend, repeated the Count. Oh, you're only playing with me, said Maximilian, falling from the heights of exaltation into the depths of despair. You're only acting like those kind mothers, or rather those selfish mothers who soothe their children's sorrow with sweet words because their crying is tiresome. No, I was wrong to tell you to be careful. Don't worry. I'll bury my grief deep inside me, and I'll make it so secret and obscure that you won't even have to take the trouble to sympathize with me. Goodbye, my friend. No, Maximilian, 
It's not goodbye. From now on, you're going to live with me without leaving my side. And within a week, we'll have left France behind us. And you still tell me to hope. Yes, because I know there's a way to cure you. Count, you make me even sadder. If such a thing is possible, you see only commonplace grief as the result of the blow I've suffered and you think you can console me with a commonplace remedy, travel. Maximilian shook his head in disdainful incredulity. I have faith in my own promises, said Monte Cristo. Let me make the experiment. You're only prolonging my agony. Is your heart so weak that you can't give your friend a few days to prove his promise? Do you know what the Count of Monte Cristo is capable of doing? Do you know that he has a great deal of worldly power at his command? Do you know that he has enough faith in God to obtain miracles from him who said that with faith a man could move mountains? I tell you to wait for this miracle or else, or else, or else I'll call you an ingrate. Have pity on me, Count. Listen to me, Maximilian. I have so much pity on you that if I haven't cured you of your grief within one month from now to the day and to the hour, I myself will place you before these pistols and before a cup of the deadliest poison of Italy, a much quicker and deadlier poison than the one that killed Valentine. Will you promise me that? I not only promise it, I swear it, said the Count, taking Maximilian's hand. In a month, on your word of honor, if I'm still not consoled, you'll leave me free to dispose of my life as I see fit, and no matter what I do, you won't call me ungrateful exactly one month, and the date is sacred. I don't know if it's occurred to you that today is the 5th of September. It was 10 years ago today that I saved your father's life when he wanted to die. Maximilian seized the Count's hands and kissed them. The Count allowed him to do so, as though he realized that this adoration was his due. A month from today, continued Monte Cristo, we will both be seated at a table on which there will be good weapons and gentle poison, but in return will you promise to go on living until then? I swear it. Monte Cristo pressed the young man to his heart and held him there for a long time. And now, he said, you will come to live with me. You may take Haiti's rooms. Haiti, what's happened to her? She left last night. She's now waiting for me to join her. Make ready to come live in my house on the Champ Elysee. But first, leave me out of here without anyone seeing me leave. Maximilian bowed his head and obeyed like a child or like a disciple.